Um, so hi, my name is Connor Walsh. Uh, I'm relatively new to InterSystems. I've been with the company for about 37 months, according to my watch. Uh, I've spent about 36 of those working with containers, and in that time, they have probably irritated me more than they have anyone else at the company. I have also probably learned to love them more than anyone else at the company. And so I thought I would talk to you today about some of the things that might frustrate you when, when you or your technical people use them, and some of the reasons why those frustrations turn out to be good in the end. Um, as we know, the modern computer was uh, more or less invented during World War II, and, uh, and it was one of the most famous World War II figures who said of containers that they are the worst form of software delivery, except for everything else that has been tried. So welcome to uh, Winston Churchill's Guide to Containers. It's the unofficial title. Um, containers are a pain in the neck to use. When you sit down, when you first start using them here, oh, it's so easy, it's really great, it's gonna change everything. You sit down and they don't quite work the way that you're used to. You've been operating with non-container software for your entire life and suddenly this thing is strange and it's fiddly and you're sitting there and none of the methods that you're used to using to interact with things quite work. Um, and this creates a lot of frustration. It's, this is normal, this is human. Uh, we like controlling our environments. This goes double for engineers. We like, oh yes, when I push this button, that lights up, great, it works, I understand it, excellent. Um, and these things are painful. However, there's a saying that some folks say about pain, which is that no pain, no gain. Um, ultimately, uh, uh, these things end up being incredibly valuable. And the reason for this is that they reduce what we call system drift. System drift is that unfortunate thing. Who's ever heard anyone say or said yourself, well, it works on my machine? Raise your hand. Yeah. So, so there's a running joke where, where people say, oh, it works on my machine. And then your manager says to you, oh, yeah, well, we'll ship your machine. Um, and, uh, and there's a, a running joke after that which says, yes, that's how Docker was born. That's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to ship your machine. And the reason that we want to do this is because every difference between the environment of your developers and what actually happens in production, every bit of that, every hardware difference, every Linux kernel difference, every configuration difference, that introduces a breeding ground for bugs. And there's this problem where the later in your development cycle you find a bug, the more it costs you money. IBM did this great study where they found that uh, if you find it during design, it costs you about a dollar. And if you find it when you're writing code, it costs you about six fifty. And if you find a bug when you're testing it, but you haven't released it yet, it costs you about $15. And it costs you 100 times as much to fix that bug once you are actually running live in production. Once your customers are actually depending on it working this particular way, it costs you 100 times as much as it would have if you'd found it back in the beginning. And by making your development environment and your production environment that much more similar, you can save about 9350 every time as you go, ah, now I find this thing, the development phase. This is fantastic. Um, this isn't a new concept. Uh, there's a guy named uh, Barry Baim who was publishing about this before I was born in 1981. Um, and the graphs that he has are actually significantly more terrifying than this one that I've got up now. Um, and the reason that this happens is because when you make an image, which is what all containers are started from, that image is immutable. And the thing that you tested was the thing that you developed, and it is the thing in production. Um, what you have is you have this great ability to stamp out a CD of your product, an immutable, this is it, it's there, it's already installed, it's running, um, at a scale that even America Online of 1990 would envy. Um, so we're gonna go over each of these pain points, and we're gonna uh, talk about why these things are a little bit frustrating, and then we're gonna talk about why they turn out to be good. As it turns out, they all do. So, step one, they're different, change is hard, I don't like it. Um, this is fair, change is, is inherently disruptive. Anytime you go from doing an old way to a new way, uh, you will, have to learn the new way of doing things. You'll have to change all of your old habits. Or maybe you'll have to change exactly half of your old habits and half of them will turn out to work, but you have to figure out which half it is and that's a whole other thing. You will have to retrain your staff. 
And this has a real dollar cost to you. And it does have some amount of slowdown to your operations, right? You say, okay, I want to do things in this new different way because I heard it's better. Oh, this is going to cost me money up front. Okay. Um, and, and again, as I said earlier, humans are happiest when they control their environment in a way that they understand. So suddenly put us, putting us in a new environment with different tools can just be frustrating. You're just sitting there at your keyboard and you're going, why doesn't it work? Oh. You don't want to go through all of this pain and all of this very real dollar cost unless there's a good reason, right? You don't want to spend money. You don't want to spend time unless you have a reason. But we understand why we spend money. We spend money on investments. Investments are good. We say, okay, by spending this money up front now, we can get, we can make more money later, we can save more money. And so the question for any investment is, what's your ROI? Um, and that's the question that you want to know. It can be pretty good. You can save 93.5% on a lot of your bugs. Not 100% of them. A few things will always fall, fall through to production. But you can save a lot of money on a lot of them. And you can do this because you unify your environments. Because the thing that you're developing is the thing that you're running in production. And the thing that you're testing is both of those. Um, the fact that this is uh, quite so reproducible means that when somebody's discovered a bug in your software, you can say, OK, here, take this version of, of the image and take this configuration file. Go. It'll happen. Run it on your machine. It dramatically simplifies the act of saying, here's the bug. Here's how to reproduce it. Here's how to fix it. Um, containers are still a little bit cheaper hardware-wise than VMs. We'll get to that a little bit uh, in the future. And, um, and it turns out that you can actually control a lot more this way than you can with traditional methods, which, oh, engineers, we love controlling our environment. It actually makes you happier in the long run, which might be why the Stack Overflow survey that came out uh, a few months ago has 78% of all uh, software engineers they surveyed love Docker and 77% love Kubernetes. Not small numbers. Um, and just because something is new doesn't mean it's going to suck. Um, and don't miss out. Don't be like these guys who are like, oh, the wheel. That sounds complicated. Um, OK, so right? change is bad. Change can be good, right? We're all there. We're following. OK, next. Containers are bad at persistence. Uh, I know a couple of you just sat through uh, Mark Bolinsky's talk about durable storage. So um, you heard, oh, by default, a container has, oh, as soon as you restart a new container, it doesn't have anything in it. If you get rid of it, it's, it's empty. It's gone back to, to a pure code state, right? And this is true, because by default, they don't know anything at all. Um, and they only remember the things that you explicitly tell them to, which means if you want them to access that pool of data over there, when you start your container, you have to say, oh, and by the way, docker run double dash volume, that thing over there. Um, and if the image state isn't quite the way that you want it to be uh, when you're running in production, then you're going to have to configure it. And if it's not quite how you want it to be when you're in development, then you're going to have to configure it. And if there's anything special you want to do at startup, like you want to expose a port so that you can talk to the web server for InterSystems Iris, then oh, you have to do that too. And if a container has an error when it starts up, if it doesn't work out, if you, if you try to start the thing and it just immediately falls over, when you remove that container and you start it again, it will probably fall over in exactly the same way. Oh, what do I do? Um, uh, that's a little bit less true, by the way, for a container that's been running for a really, really long time. Um, that only applies to, to things which, which fail on start. Um, but that consistency there and that blankness ends up being kind of a win. Um, because by default, it doesn't know anything. This turns out to be good. Um, you take the things that you need, and you bake them into the image. If there's a configuration that you need in production, then you bake that in so that whenever you're running it, and you're just sitting at your keyboard, and your engineers are working away, ta-da, it already comes up doing exactly what you need it to do. Um, and that means that that's the thing that you're working with on a daily basis. You are absolutely eating your own dog food. Have you all heard the eating your own dog food phrase? Yes. Raise your hand if you've heard of that. Oh, oh I get to introduce a whole new generation to this idea. Um, so there's this wonderful, wonderful idea which says if you're a software company and you make any kind of software and you could possibly use it inside your company, do so. 
if, if you're Jira and you're trying to track your own workflow, use Jira. Um, because the kind of feedback that you get from customers of software is, is you only get the most extreme stuff. You only get the stuff that somebody tells their manager, who tells the sales engineer, who tells the account manager that makes it back to you. But when you actually use it on a daily basis, you get a certain level of familiarity with it and you realize the things that are maybe frustrating your users or making your users really happy on a daily basis. Um, and so this is sometimes known as eating your own dog food, which is a phrase I really enjoy. Um, and, uh, and when you have um, uh, a configuration of a container, any product, could be Inner Systems Iris, could be anything else, then you get to use the production version of it in your development environment every day, in your testing environment every day, which gives you that much more familiarity with how your product is actually being used. Um, the fact that containers come up in kind of an empty state reduces faults a lot. Um, they, uh, they always come up in a pretty consistent way. And yes, sometimes there's a bug in that particular configuration of the container. And so 10,000 copies of it fail all at the same time. This is a pretty bad day, but you've still only got one bug and you only need to fix one bug and you know exactly how to reproduce that one bug because if it failed those 10,000 times, you go back to the previous version you're using, you take the buggy version, you hand it over to your dev team and you say, fix it. And they go, mm. um, uh, And uh, one of the other things that's really nice about this is that containers start very, very fast. They start a lot, lot faster than a brand new virtual machine. And this is great because one of the things that, that the way that you calculate uptime is you, you take your mean time between failure, your MBTF, um, and you divide that by, uh, by itself plus the mean time to repair, right? So if it only takes you, if it takes you a day to come back up, then you're not going to have four nines of uptime unless you fail once every several years. Um, but if it takes you a minute to come back up, you're doing pretty well. If it takes you literally a second to come back up after a failure, then suddenly you can get some really, really good uptime out of that, even if your failures are happening every couple of months. Um, so the fact that that happens very quickly is nice. Um, some data is going to need to persist. Hi, we are InterSystems. We love helping you store your data. That's kind of our thing. Um, and uh, this is why we gave you Durable Sys. This is why we went and developed that and said, okay, here you're gonna to wanna to be able to separate your code and your data. If you wanna know more about Durable Sys, I heartily invite you to go to the talks on that. They're fantastic. Um, uh, we do this because, again, every bit of difference, every bit of code that is different between development and production introduces risk and could cost you $100. Um, and containers help you make that as similar as possible. Um, uh, lastly on that topic, there are some methods that keep being used for a reason. Sometimes, oh, have you tried turning it off and on again? Works. And evidence suggests from some, some documentaries about the future that have you tried turning it off and on again will, will still work several centuries from now. Um, uh, when we when we boldly go, um, all right. We're all following that. Sometimes that lack of persistence is good. Excellent. Okay. Changing an image is hard. I have a change. I want to make a new, different, better container image. Ah, oh, it's annoying. In fact, images by default are read only, right? Like we were talking about, they're CDs, right? Um, and, and if you go into a running container and you say, hey, I want to go and edit that file, you're not even going to have a text editor in almost any container. You're, you're like, oh, I'd like to vim file. Wait, there's no vim. I don't, what? Ah. Um, which means the only thing you'll find in there is a uh, text editor, um, is a text editor which is actually designed for uh, automation rather than human beings, which is called SED, which is a nice old Unix tool. If you can use said to manually edit text files to do what you want, congratulations, you are a wizard. And also, I invite you to play said sweeper, which is the game Minesweeper implemented entirely using regular expressions. I've got some of the sample code of it right here. Um, adding a new package to, to a, an existing container can be difficult or impossible. And depending on how secure that container is, you may not even have root privileges when it's running to add that. Um, spare libraries often don't exist if you're like, oh, but I need this other dependency because I'm doing this other thing. It's not there. 
And if you have an SSH key or a software license or any other credential that is valuable and secret, it's probably not going to be in the container and putting it in the container is going to be difficult and annoying. Right? So suddenly here's all these things that you have to do. Why doesn't it just work? Uh, the answer to this is that changing one container is kind of hard. Changing all of them turns out to be a lot easier. Um, they are easy to change at scale. Uh, uh, we're going to go into this a little bit, and this is going to be very brief because most of you heard this in other talks today. Uh, the way that this works is you get your, your software artifact. Ooh, I'm going too close to the speaker. Uh, you get your software artifact, and, uh, and you write all your code, and you test it out, and you build it, and your development team says, aha, here is the product. It is completely perfect in every way. Here you go. And they hand it over to the testing team, who says, perfect in every way, eh? Challenge accepted. Um, and they proceed to jump up and down on it until they break it. Uh, kind of like that American Tourister ad, but with software. Um, if they break it, then they send it back and they say, okay, it's broken in the following way, fix it, send us another one. Eventually, you discover that it is not broken and it goes into production. Um, but what happens is when you build that image, it is kind of like burning a CD or burning a DVD in that it becomes a read-only thing that cannot be changed, it can only be executed. Um, it can be read from, it can be executed, but it cannot be edited easily. Um, and then you make 10,000 copies of it. If you need to make a change to one container, you probably don't want to make that change to just one container. You probably want to make that change to all of your containers running that particular application across your whole organization. Or if what you're saying is, oh, I need this one to run with these credentials and this one to run with these credentials, then what you actually need is you need to be using secrets management. A lot of the container orchestrators Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, et cetera, uh, will include secrets management, and they will let you put your things like SSH keys and license keys um, and X509 certificates and anything else you might need um, in a place that is securely stored. And if you're doing it right, it is never actually written to disk. It is shared exclusively in, in RAM amongst a network of computers. So even if somebody breaks in and pulls a hard drive from one of those servers, there is no secret on it. What? Um, and if you use secrets management extensively and you're using that in production, you can use that in development too, which then means that you're delivering those secrets in production in exactly the same way that your developers have been using for the last three years, which will make that process a lot smoother. It will also make your InfoSec team a lot happier because you will be protecting the secrets. Um, uh, lastly, when it comes to editing files in a container, you probably shouldn't do that. If you really, really need to debug that exactly one production server because it's down and you're losing a million dollars every hour, then maybe that's the thing you have to do. But otherwise, you generally want to be editing it in your build process and you want to be deploying that artifact. You want to edit it, burn the edited version under the CD, run that CD. Um, on the other hand, said sweeper is still hilarious because uh, you can throw regular expressions at a co-NP complete problem, which is always a great way to solve those. Uh, and if you uh, want a copy of it, it's at github.com slash ninewise slash said sweeper. Um, not all of the language in it is strictly G-rated. Um, another thing folks complain about, there are a few ways to access containers. Oh, I want to get in there. I want to do this thing. I want to access this port. I want to access this service. Oh, I can't. Oh, it's awful. Um, you're going to have to expose it, or you're going to have to publish it. And uh, that extra package, you might not even have privileges to run apt-get or yum. Um, oh, I want to uh, SSH into that container so that I can examine the thing, because I want to run top inside of it, right? I want to see all the processes in that. Um, I want to look at that file. I don't want to just page through it manually. Um, oh, I would like to uh, run GDB. I want to attach GDB to the running process because something I want to inspect that more carefully, GDB being the uh, GNU Unix debugger. Um, and so suddenly, all of these things that you normally do when you're a certain type of software engineer, tester, DevOps, sysadmin, you can't do any of those things. The only thing you can do is run the application as it was given to you. This is the worst, right? Wait, I think that might actually be good. <laughs> um, 
the fewer ways to access ends up being fewer ways to exploit it. The fact that you can't attach a debugger to this running process means that if somebody maliciously breaks into your container and tries to access memory in a way they're not supposed to, they can't. All they can do is run the code that you gave them. If they want to add an additional package, they can't. If they say, hmm, you know what? I think that the people running this didn't learn from Unix of the 1980s, and they probably still have a finger daemon running on port 79, and I'm just going to tell it into that. They can't, because port 79 isn't exposed unless you went out of your way to expose that one port. Um, uh, they have no extra kernel capabilities. We'll get into kernel capabilities a little bit. Um, uh, and they have no access to the host other than the access that you gave them. They have no access to the file system. They have no access to the network card. They have nothing. Um, there are exceptions to this. There's no such thing as perfect security. There's no such thing as, oh, this thing is absolutely secure in every way. Um, I am not an information security professional. I am friends with people who are, and I've noticed that they never say, oh yeah, that, that's secure. That's not a, a phrase that they ever use. Sometimes they will say, that thing is incredibly insecure. And sometimes they will say, that thing is more secure. But nothing is ever, there's no such thing as absolute security. Maybe if you have it written down on a piece of paper and then you put that piece of paper in Fort Knox, maybe. We'll see. Um, uh, also, in case you're thinking, wait, I can't debug or run S-Trace or I can't look at the thing. There are ways to do that. You can do that in production. You need to have access to the host, which is a thing that your system administrators and your, your technical staff is going to have, and a thing that malicious attackers probably won't. Um, okay, all right. Fewer ways to access, turns out to be a good thing. We're on board, yeah, okay. Next, uh, next complaint that I hear occasionally, containers, they're Linux first and everything else kind of second. This Docker for Windows, Docker for Mac stuff, it's kind of weird, right? It doesn't quite do the thing that I want. I tried to start up that thing and it crashed in some weird way or there's a thing and now my computer's running slow and I don't understand. So this is true. Uh, containers are fundamentally a, a Linux tech. Um, containers are what happened when some folks run a bunch, wrote a bunch of different features into the Linux kernel. Um, in the late 90s and early 2000s. And, uh, and they were all there. C groups were there, CH root jails were there, kernel capabilities were there, and process namespaces were there. And, uh, and then several years ago, some folks at Docker Incorporated came along and said, what if we configure all of that for you? What if we take all of these Linux features and we bundle them all up, and all you do is you push this one button and bam, all your stuff is running in this nicely shaped delineated box that Linux gives you the tools to build. Um, and, uh, and then some folks said, that's great. Can I get it on Windows? And they went, uh, because the code that makes those things go is all entirely based on Linux. Um, Docker is effectively, and, and other container engines as well, really, really fantastic aluminum siding. It's really pretty, it's easy to install, it's relatively durable. It is not holding up the roof. The thing that is holding up the roof in this case is the Linux kernel. It is one of the oldest and, and best developed pieces of open source software that the species of humanity has yet to publish. Um, and so when you're on uh, Windows or Mac, what happens is when you install that thing on your, your personal laptop, desktop, etc., it actually starts up a secret Linux virtual machine and it runs your entire container runtime on that Linux virtual machine and then just kind of gives you a nice front end on top of that. So sometimes containers are a little bit weird when you run Linux containers on a Windows or Macintosh host because there's some shenanigans going on. Um, uh, this ends up being a pretty good thing too. Chances are good that in production you want to be running your Linux code on a Linux host this is okay. Uh, Docker for Windows is great for fiddling around. It's great for, uh, I want to look at this thing. I don't want to SSH into something. I'm on a plane right now. I can't SSH into something. Um, but I still want to fiddle with this and see how it goes. Um, and, but, but adding an entire virtual machine to do that ends up being a little bit silly when you want to run in production. Uh, additionally, there's a fantastic talk, which I greatly enjoy. Um, and if you are, are on the technical end of the spectrum, 
uh, Liz Rice did something called Building a Container from Scratch in Go. It's about 20 minutes long, and she has 52 lines of code in the Go programming language, which Google wrote. And over the course of this, she builds an entire container engine by making a bunch of Linux system calls and saying, here's all the things that you need to do to do that. Because that's how much of the meat of the work of containers is really done in the Linux kernel. She really does type it all out in real time while chatting with the audience. It's fantastic to watch. You don't really need to understand the Go language. If you've ever read code and understood it in any programming language, you'll be able to follow along with what's going on. And you'll see how much of the heavy lifting is really done by Linux. Um, this is not perfect. Um, this is not in every way the perfect multi-tenancy, perfect isolation. Everything is the best that it's ever been. Um, but it is better. It is better than anything else we have. And attempting to achieve any of these things with pure virtual machines could work, but at that point you start losing a lot of efficiency because you have to spin up a whole OS kernel and a whole set of file buffers and a whole set of all these other things in order to make that go. So you can pack a lot more applications onto the same metal, onto the same silicon using containers than you could with, uh, with virtual machines. Um, and lastly, uh, Linux is pretty much the most tested code on the planet, plus or minus, although it's still not as widely deployed as SQLite. Um, if you've never heard of SQLite, it's a tiny little database that somebody wrote 20 something years ago. It's very lightweight, it's very easy, and you probably have over 100 copies of it in your pocket right now. We think there are literally trillions of copies of this in the wild, including some on the moon. Um, so that's a, a fun bit of trivia. Um, all right. We're almost to the end of the technical stuff but this is the worst part. Um, Linux containers don't have all the kernel capabilities. All the things that you're normally able to do in Linux when you're running as root, you can't do in a default container, right? Um, there's this uh, great list of, of different kernel capabilities. All the ones that are grayed out, you don't have in a normal container. Um, some of those are important. If you want really good performance options, you're gonna need IPC lock that gives you huge pages that lets you allocate memory more efficiently. Um, if you're gonna debug stuff, you need ptrace. If you want to do virtual IP or change routing tables or reconfigure your network, uh, you're gonna need net admin. Um, and uh, there's a list of like 27 different things that you need uh, capsys admin for because capsys admin controls everything. Um, and if your container is running, and you forgot to give it this capability when you started it up. You said, oh, I forgot to give it IPC lock. You cannot then grant that to the running container. You have to stop it and you have to start a new one that says here, you are allowed to lock pages in memory. Um, this ends up being a good thing. Um, this means that we're applying what's called the principle of least privilege. This means that this code is reliably running in an environment where it can't do anything that it's not supposed to be able to do. Um, and you can configure this so that you remove more and more of those capabilities from your container. It can only do the things that it's absolutely supposed to do. Um, if you declare in your orchestrator or in your Docker run command, you say, oh, I need IPC lock because I need performance because I'm going to be allocating uh, 300 gigabytes of RAM for my global buffers, um, then you, you ask for IPC lock and it shall be given to you. Um, buggy containers can do less harm to the system because they can't run rampant, they can't suddenly reconfigure things, they can't certainly hard reserve all the RAM on your machine. And if someone maliciously hijacks some of your, your applications, then there's less harm that they can do. Pretty cool. Uh, suddenly the fact that you can't escalate those capabilities in a running container becomes secure rather than annoying. Uh, and uh, Capsys admin is still kind of a mess. Um, the Linux kernel team is in negotiations to rename it to Cap Kitchen Sync because it gates a lot of things. Um, okay. We're done with all the hard technical stuff. Um, the last thing that containers do that pretty consistently frustrates us is they introduce what I like to call Yanla, which is yet another new layer of abstraction. 
they, they say, oh, here's yet another thing that you have to do. Here's another layer that's in between me and the code that I'm trying to run. Um, and I say, oh, I can't, just, I can't just go directly in. I can't just type C session at the prompt. I can't just type Iris session. Why, why am I doing it this new way? This is, there's an extra hoop I have to jump through. What is the point of this, right? Oh. Um, and uh, and there's, there is something that you lose by taking all the things that you're used to and wrapping it up in this big box. Um, and in order to talk about that, we're gonna talk a little bit about the actual big metal boxes. Um, uh, you all heard the keynote earlier from the Mediterranean Shipping Company. We're all familiar with big metal boxes. You've been to a container talk ever in your lives and you've seen many, many pictures of big metal boxes. So we talk about big metal boxes for a reason. We talk about them uh, for some very, very real reasons. Moving stuff around used to be a lot more awful than it is now. Um, it used to be that every bunch of, every bag of bananas or every barrel of oil or every crate of anything, you would have to have some folks pick it up, move it around, take it off the ship, put it onto the truck, put it onto the train, put it onto the whatever. Um, this was pretty awful and uh, it involved a lot of labor. It cost a lot of money and sometimes people dropped stuff and lost fingers or toes. Um, speaking of someone who used to work in shipping, objects are heavy and I don't like dropping them on my feet. Um, so now when we do this, we put things in these huge metal boxes, right? The, uh, the standard global shipping container is about 40 feet long. And um, putting things into one of these big metal boxes is kind of annoying. It used to be you could just load it onto the truck and that was fine. And, um, and then taking the thing out of the box is annoying. So when you're at the factory and loading it in, that's frustrating. And when you're the customer ultimately receiving delivery, that's annoying. So why did we do this? Why did we put it into the big metal box? right? Also, the big metal box weighs hundreds of pounds because it's a big steel box. So that adds weight, which adds money. So why are we doing this? Why is the entire world putting all this stuff in this big metal box to move it around? Um, and you know, come to think of it, we tried this back in 1844. The French male did this. They used to have what they called a portainer, which is a big thing. They would lift right off of these little horse and carriage and they, they would move the mail around that way. Experiment was, uh, let's go with limited success. So people asked in 1955 when Malcolm McLean first invented the modern shipping container, they say, why are we doing this? This is just going to annoy everyone. And, and in fact, some of the folks, when they saw this new way of doing things, they said, no, we, we shouldn't do this totally newfangled way. In fact, what I would like to do is I would like to go back to the old, old way. I still don't fully agree with the new way. I would like to go back to putting things directly on donkeys because I understand how to put a thing on donkeys and donkeys are very efficient. They're also well-established technology, right? They have proven benefits. Uh, they have known bugs. And uh, some of the very, very old documentation on donkeys is still available. And if you can translate it, it still applies today. Um, and uh, they hardly ever bite you once you get to know them. Um, so. Uh, some folks, anytime you try to introduce some change, will say, why would we do this new thing? In fact, we shouldn't even do the thing we're doing now. We should go back to how we used to do it. Um, but when it comes to shipping, the whole world uses these big metal box shipping containers. We cannot live without this thing. And that's because shipping containers are better at multi-tenancy. Uh, you can't uh, take oil barrels and stack them on top of a big pile of bananas. Uh, that doesn't really work. Um, you can take bananas and stack them on top of oil barrels but I would not want to eat those bananas. Um, uh, the fact that every one of these boxes is the same size and shape and has the same anchor points means that you can make machinery which moves thousands of boxes an hour. And automation and safety have improved mean time between fingers. Um, uh, pictured here, we've got, uh, that's the CPO Savannah on the left and uh, the Mediterranean Shipping Company's own Rafaya. Um, which has uh, nine cranes over it, which I think unloads that in less than a day. Um, I looked it up. That ship is currently off the coast of China. Uh, it's, it's docked at a port there. Um, apparently, they know exactly where their entire fleet is at all times. Um, 
it turns out that the, the win here is not actually from the big metal box. The win here is from the things that the big metal box lets us do. It gives us these giant overhead cranes. That's why this is good. 60% um, uh, of all global trade by dollar and 90% of all non-bulk shipping, which is to say not big tankers full of oil or iron ore, um, are done in a container. Um, the United States alone moves so many containers that it is this much bigger than the Empire State Building. Um, and we're actually only a small percentage of global container shipping. The reason that this ate the planet is that we can automate it. The reason that this ate the planet is because, yes, it's difficult to take things and put them in the box, but when the truck gets to where the boat is, instead of having to pay an entire crew of people to unload every object individually, you just have one big metal crane, pick up the box, move it over there, and the whole thing takes less than 60 seconds. Um, and the amount of savings that you get from every one of those what's called intermodal transfers ends up completely dwarfing in every way the cost of buying the box, of shipping the extra weight of the big metal box, of having built the cranes to do the thing. The fact that you can orchestrate this, the fact that you can automate this, means that that extra weight and annoyance is meaningless because it allows you to rule the world. Um, but in order to get there, we had to put it in a box first. We had to standardize it. We had to take all this stuff, put it in there, and say, this is the size of the box, and this is where the attachment points on that box are. Everyone go. When it comes to software containers, we kind of can't live without those either. Um, Docker is running on one out of five hosts on the planet right now. Um, they're just one container vendor. They're the most popular, but they're just one of them. Um, they have over 5 million apps published on their Docker Hub right now. Uh, they're here, they're on the fourth floor. Go over, say hi to them. They will say, yep, it's over 5 million. They might also give you some numbers for how many of those get downloaded every week. The numbers are terrifying. Um, according to Stack Overflow, uh, uh, four-fifths of all developers love Docker, love Kubernetes, and the majority of developers are using containers on a regular basis in the course of their job. Uh, Portworks says that 82% uh, of, of uh, IT professionals work for a company that uses containers. And uh, almost, uh, sorry, about half of them are orchestrated. In almost all of the orchestration environments, it's Kubernetes, but there are some folks use uh, Mesos and some folks use uh, uh, some other ones. Um, and the reason that we do that is, is again, it's that automation. It's we went to all the trouble putting that thing in a box, but what that gives us, it gives us a standard service to grab onto. You can say, Docker start, Docker stop. You can uh, uh, check the health of any given container because they all have a defined way of running a health check. Um, uh, the, um, the adoption of these things is only uh, projected to increase. When I was putting this talk together, I looked around. I checked anywhere for any prediction, any survey, any market evidence that this was in any way not going to continue to get a more and more widely deployed thing in the world. I could not find one. For the life of me and a lifetime spent searching for things on the internet, I literally could not find a single forecast that said, eh, containers, we think they're actually a fad. There are one or two companies where they said, we tried it, didn't work for us, for our particular use case. But the vast majority of the industry is still pro projected to get more and more into this, which is good news for those of us who want to hire a couple more container experts. So the point of this is that even though they can be kind of annoying, even when you or when your engineers are sitting there at the keyboard, and this can frustrate you a little bit, and you can say, oh, this is, but I wanted to just type a text. I wanted to just launch the thing. I wanted it to just work. Oh. Um, what you get is you get the ability to, to win at this huge strategic scale. You get the ability to have a much more consistent environment, which means you find your bugs faster, and you have a lower variety of bugs, which means you don't have to fix as many of them. You know, it's not, oh, I have 17 bugs. It's I have two bugs, but they both happen a lot. Um, uh, the fact that everything is wrapped up in this nice interface where only a small number of ports are exposed means that you can reduce the complexity 
of your application. You can reduce the complexity of the interface with it, which means other people can, can uh, interoperate with it a little bit more smoothly. Um, having that universal interface gives you better mean time between fingers, I mean failure, um, and, uh, and lets you orchestrate on a, on a really, really wide scale. Um, and again, every bug that you find here, every one of these, these pains in the neck that leads you to have a slightly different habit is potentially saving you a lot of money because stuff breaks in production. Code breaks, and it breaks because production has sand in the gears. And one of the things that you are doing when you run in, in this fully orchestrated environment or, or even just in a Docker run manually at the command line is you're taking some of the sand in the gears in production and you are importing it into your own development environment, which means you are building sandproof gears. This is amazing. And, uh, you know, I'm okay with saving 93.5% of my costs on a regular basis. I feel pretty good about that. Um, yeah, those things are going to annoy me. Each one of those things is going to frustrate me. Each one of those things is going to make me sit at the keyboard and go, oh, this again. But it turns out that when you take all these things and you put them together, you save a lot of money and you get a lot done. Um, that's all I've got for today. Uh, uh, thank you for coming to a skeptic's guide and or uh, Winston Churchill's guide for containers. Um, I don't know how many of y'all have questions, but my theory is that this is the very last slot and some people really want to go to the bar. So I feel like the kindest thing that I can do is say, anybody who wants to go, you just go. Anybody who has a question, come on up and ask. I will be here for as long as it takes to answer all your questions. Sound good to folks? Excellent.